good choice, but it was the best choice that they had. You have a fire, and it's not just contained to the engine, it's now encompassed almost the full bottom of the left wing. It was a plane trying to, to survive. Seconds later, engine number one fails. The Concorde's chances of making the airfield rapidly diminish. So now you have two engines trying to do the work of four. You have an airplane that's wallowing in the air because it hasn't built up sufficient flying speed. And now all of a sudden you have a controllability issue. And you have an airplane that's on fire. The plane became totally unflyable. The crew tried to recover by reducing the power on the two living engines. But uh, it was again of no use. As bystanders watch in horror, the plane banks to the left and crashes into a small hotel. It was such a huge fire that I couldn't see anything. No plane, no wreckage, no hotel. 113 people die, including four on the ground. The tragedy sends a shockwave through the aviation world. Just now across the wires from Associated Press, an Air France Concorde crashes outside Paris shortly after takeoff, slamming into a hotel. It was a scene from hell. It was absolute pandemonium. People were literally all around me shaking. We were all absolutely in shock. All we could see was a huge bonfire. Immediately after the crash of Air France Flight 4590 outside Paris, aviation experts and investigators arrived to unearth clues from the smoldering wreckage. Uh, it was uh, really a nightmare. Once I was on the scene, I knew that uh, the bodies were not there anymore, but uh, death was everywhere. When the flight data and voice recorders are located, investigators take them in for analysis. Two recorders were not in excellent shape, and especially the data recorder. Initially, we learned uh, not much. Slowly, we began to make a scenario. The crash site is not the only place where investigators look for clues. The runway where the aircraft departed also becomes a focus. The streaks of soot and fuel on the runway indicate a fuel leakage that could have fed the raging blaze. But how did the leak start? We found a, a part of uh, the tank and uh, small parts of the plane. Uh, we found also uh, something which was not from the plane. It was a strip of metal. It was not a part of the Concorde, and it had nothing to do on the runway. How this piece of metal could have contributed to the crash is unclear until another crucial clue is discovered. You can think of it as a jigsaw puzzle. And what they found is they reassembled the tire parts that were on, on the runway that the, the pattern matched the piece of metal. So it was consistent with the tire having rolled over this piece of metal. The shape of the damage to the tire clearly matches the shape of the piece of metal found on the runway. Investigators examined dozens of aircraft, trying to find out where the foreign piece of debris could have come from. They found not only the plane, they found the place where the part uh, had been. A Continental DC-10 is found with a wear strip missing. The strip was a reinforcement that came loose when the plane took off shortly before Concorde. Investigators are confident they have identified a crucial part of the accident sequence. But the question remains, how could a damaged tire lead to a fatal crash? Greg Fyth is a crash investigator and a former consultant to Continental Airlines on an unrelated case. At speeds of up to 200 miles an hour, when that tire blew out after striking that piece of metal, it turned to shrapnel, and those small and large fragments of rubber started to strike the bottom of the aircraft. The rubber strikes the underside of the wing, and behind the skin of that wing is a huge fuel tank. And these chunks of rubber hit the bottom of the fuel tank. Even though it didn't breach the fuel tank, it sent shock waves that overpressured the tank. In this case, the shock wave created an overpressure system. It's basically expanding in the tank. It blows it from inside out, creating a hole for the fuel to leak out of it. Captured on camera through the window of a passing truck, jet fuel begins spewing out of the wing and into the air, where it vaporizes and ignites. Once the fire gets going, there's no way to stop it. As the roll picked up in magnitude, their ability to maintain a level flight was degraded and the nose started down. 
Ten years after the crash, Continental Airlines and two of its employees go on trial in Paris for involuntary manslaughter. All deny the charges. Under French law, it's standard for a criminal investigation to be opened after a plane crash. But it's highly unusual for an airline to face criminal charges. During the trial, Continental says Air France knew of deficiencies in Concorde's wheels. Air France denies the allegations and maintains the accident would not have happened if the wear strip hadn't been on the runway. In the same trial, the former head of testing for Concorde, former head engineer for Concorde, and a retired civil aviation chief are also tried for involuntary manslaughter. They denied the charges. The trial debated the role of many factors, including debris on the runway, fuel load, baggage weight, scheduling pressure, and a missing tire spacer. An accident is a series of events. Um, all accidents are a series of events. This one was many events coming together very tragically. Continental Airlines and one of its mechanics were found guilty of manslaughter. The trial exposed several contributory factors. I don't think that that piece of metal brought the airplane down. I think it played a factor in the cause of the accident, but I don't think it was the sole responsible cause of the accident. Now that we know what happened, it was waiting to happen, but it needed so many extraordinary, impossible uh, events to happen the same day at the same moment. Even before the verdict, the aviation industry undertakes some safety changes. Debris on the runway is now seen as an even greater threat to aircraft. Concorde is refitted with burst-resistant tires, and fuel tanks are reinforced. But for Concorde, it is the beginning of the end. Three years after the crash, the aircraft is retired. For many people, this plane was uh, something, was a symbol. And they lost something with uh, the end of the Concorde story. Coming up, moments after takeoff, fire erupts inside the cabin of a DC-9, sending it nose first into the Florida Everglades. A DC-9 takes off from Miami International Airport and begins its ascent. As it reaches 10,000 feet, fire breaks out in the cargo hold. Moments later, the pilots lose control of the plane and plunge into the Everglades. They discovered that it had already burnt up pretty much in the sky. 11th of May, 1996. Value Jet Flight 592 has just taken off from Miami, bound for Atlanta, Georgia. Six minutes after takeoff, the pilots hear a loud noise from inside the body of the plane. Seconds later, the electrical systems fail. The first officer radios air traffic control. Jesse Fisher is on duty. His voice was very calm. Um, very in control. He didn't sound urgent. While the pilots are assessing the electrical failure, smoke has started to come up through the floors of the cabin. Uh, smoke in the cabin. Smoke in the cabin. Roger. The smoke moves into the flight deck. And the airplane finally levels off and begins a turn, and the pilot is now a little bit more intense in his. With no electrical systems, the pilots struggle to maintain control of the situation. As they try to make their way back towards Miami, fire begins to come up through the cabin floor. He is more intent, so now my heart rates up. I said, proceed direct to the airport. He said, I need vectors. And now in my mind, I'm thinking, that's not good. He's got so much smoke, he can't see his instrumentation. Vector 592, turn left, heading 140. So I started issuing the vectors, bringing them back around. The turn was real slow coming back toward the airport, um, but still a lot of airspeed. At about 9,500 feet is when he says, I need the nearest airport. He's maybe two or three miles closer to Dade Collier. But at his rate of speed and altitude, he can easily make Miami. And Miami has services. We have the fire equipment, there's medical, 
Dade Collier is out in the Everglades and there's nothing there. Walton Little is fishing in the Everglades and can see that something's going very wrong for Flight 592. When I hear the, the loud jet noise, I look to my left shoulder. I see a large aircraft, uh, unusually low to the ground. We're like, okay, this is probably going to be a crash on the airport now. I realize that the bank angle is getting steeper and steeper and actually approaches and exceeds 90 degrees, such that it's rolling over on its back. When the plane banks at that angle, the wings can't provide enough lift, causing the plane to lose altitude. If the wings are level, then 100% of the lift is counteracting gravity. When you have it at a 45 degree angle of bank, then only half of it can be counteracting the lift so that the, the greater the bank angle, the less available lift there is to counteract gravity, which makes it harder to maintain altitude. Something was changing too rapidly for the radar data to keep up with it. From 9,000 feet, I saw one more hit at 1,000 feet. Now that's, that's bad. That's real bad. That's a rate of descent like a fighter jet. That's 8,000 feet a minute which is screaming down. When that nose drop occurred, I realized it was going to crash. There is no further communication from the flight. I knew they were down, and it's a, it's, um, it's a helpless feeling. As the aircraft disappeared below the horizon, what appeared immediately afterward was a very large wave of water that rose up like a, a wave at a beach. All 110 people on board are killed. All right, we will show you a live picture of the crash scene, that area of scorched earth surrounded by water and the green Everglades around it. Very, very little left in terms of wreckage. Investigators spend weeks combing through the swamp looking for clues. Is they found more and more of the wreckage and they were able to look in the forward cargo hold. They realized that there was a lot of fire damage in the floor of the fuselage. There was a lot of fire damage and high temperature fire. The fire appeared to have started in the cargo hold, but no one knew how it could have spread. These types of cargo compartments are designed to contain a fire. So why, why didn't the liner contain the fire? The investigators check records to see what was being transported in the hold. They find mail, three tires on their way to another value jet plane, and then something suspicious. They found that there were oxygen generators in there, and they found evidence that some of the generators had been discharged. That suddenly would explain why the containment liner had not worked. Inside the cargo hold are the charred remains of nine activated canisters. Oxygen generators use a chemical process to produce oxygen in the event passengers need it during a decompression. According to the NTSB, they were improperly secured for shipping. It turned out it was just very apparently shoddy workmanship. But what causes the fire? According to the NTSB, a disturbance such as a bump on the runway may have made the spring-loaded lever on the canisters hit the tiny charge on the caps. This impact creates a small explosion and starts a reaction inside the canisters. Oxygen is generated and released into the hold. The reaction also produces heat with temperatures up to 260 degrees Celsius. The combination of heat and pure oxygen creates a voracious fire. Inside the hold, the pure oxygen allows the fire to burn through the liner and up into the cabin, melting the floor beams under the passengers' feet. They discovered that it was, had already burnt up pretty much in the sky. There was a breakdown there. There was a series of communications breakdown. A lot of safety changes came out as a result. There's an absolute flat prohibition against shipping oxygen generators by air. Class D cargo compartments now have the ability to detect a fire. Charges are brought against Value Jet's maintenance contractor, Sabertech. Sabertech ultimately pleads no contest to one state charge of mishandling hazardous waste. The company also faces 24 federal charges, but is convicted of only one, 
failure to train employees in handling hazardous materials. Before the cases are finished, Sabertech goes...